At Home with Tyler Joseph from 21 Pilots on Apple Music. Yo. Yo. Tyler, it's good to see you. Thanks for stepping into this space. This has been something yeah, that's brought so much joy to me, being able to connect with people I really admire, dare I say love, and talk about music that you love, and just have a human conversation away from all of the game and the whole idea of like what it is to play it and to put music out and promote and everything else. It's like, it's just nice to be able to stretch into music as a craft, as a fan. And I'm really looking forward to this show with you. I'm really looking forward to the music in the chat. Yeah, it's really interesting, the landscape. When everything started to roll out with the virus and all the news my mom just said something in passing to me over the phone she's like man i could really use something to just take my mind off this something a little more a little more happy and you know that's when i started writing this song level of concern panic on the brain world has gone insane things are starting to get heavy it's interesting, there's this timeline that a lot of artists and bands are used to at an international level, which is a tough task. Yeah. But we're used to just recording, writing, and releasing. We really tasked everyone, you know, all of our partners and everyone that helped us release this with like, hey, this needs to come out right now or it's it's not coming out. We were proud to kind of like put a stake in the ground of like, hey, we just released this song. I think it's very 21 Pilots to do that, to be like, look, you know, you may have had to wait a few years for our last album, but hey, we're back real quick and who knows what comes next. And I like that about your band. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't necessarily supposed to be a flex of, you know, how quickly we can move and how DIY this whole thing is, but that's the truth. It all kind of came together in a moment where we could do a video, we could do a song all within a few days. And there was something about that release that I knew that I didn't want to overthink it. There's always that chance and... um opportunity to overthink and because I knew that the lyrical content and just the style of the song in general was really a now or never type of thing I let the simplicity of it happen without overthinking it and, and just sent it and then I woke up now I hear it and I'm going you know this is all the things I could have done with it but I'm glad it's out there I mean, you're covering a lot of ground and songs play a big part in this. You clearly love songs. You clearly love really coherent, cohesive, emotional themes and threads. No one tells a story, at least to my mind, in a way that walks the line between emotional and at times humorous and playful like Ben Folds. I mean, as soon as the guy heard his own voice, he probably thought, I'm not going to be able to get away with what Billy Joel gets away with. But yet somehow he was able to reach the same kind of emotional depth. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's one of my favorites. I think the first time I actually heard him was a buddy of mine in high school gave me a CD that he had burned of him live in concert, just him and his piano. What an intro. Which I was like, wow. I don't know who this guy is, but I'm currently trying to learn how to play the piano and my friend knew this, so he's like, you gotta listen to Ben Folds. And I heard this record of him and his piano in front of a live audience. You know, he wasn't nailing every single note. It wasn't this overproduced show. It was just him and his piano, and yet the energy that he was able to find inside of that instrument by itself with that crowd was just just, I fell in love with how orchestral the piano could be if you really tried. The piano returns back the energy you give it, and that's why Definitely. I fell in love with the instrument. We did the bottom. I thought it was my fault. And in a way, I guess it was. We just played Ben Foles to kick off what's going to be an amazing ride right here with Tyler from 21 Pilots. He's isolated at home. I'm isolated at home. Somehow we're connected. And Ben Foles, you talked about his energy and performance and his ability to be able to take songs, which sometimes are so reflective and recorded environment and breathe so much fire into them live. I've seen him do it. Yeah. Billy Joel is known for that. Billy Joel mm -hmm. made a name for himself by coming out into those bars that you talked about, but in New York City and literally blowing the roof off the place. I mean, turning the piano, dare I say, into his there's no doubt about it you know Billy Joel is a monster and he's become this really hallowed kind of like elder statesman figure and he was a punk rocker back in the 70s yeah not only that but when you listen to his full breath of work you can see where he comes in and he's there to shake it up and then you can see the second round yeah. where he's wondering if he should still be in there you know still rock and roll to me he's talking about how times are changing and if and if he still applies or not and he takes refuge in not knowing what the right move is next yeah. musically and it's so interesting that even back then in the 70s where we all look back at least i do and i just hear that's old music but even inside of that time frame there was newer 
newer music coming and older music wondering if it should stay or go and realizing that that tale is as old as time where there's changes of guard and there's wondering when to give up your guard there's wondering to continue to make what you've already made or to make what you feel like is the next step and it's fun to watch someone like him ask those questions she can kill with a smile she can wound with her eyes and she can ruin your faith with her casual lies the fact that things are always changing and you're questioning what role do we play in this? I wonder, Tyler, is that a constant for you? Is that part of the motivation behind the restlessness of yourself and 21 Pilots? Yeah, you know, I've always wondered if there was a um, there was a limit to how much new music someone wants to hear. You know, at a certain point in my life, I kind of started to tie the ropes off and say, hey, this is my music. This is the stuff I love. And it's hard to penetrate that and show me a new project that I'm in love with. And I think the older that I get, the harder it is to break through that. And so I wonder, as an artist who's creating songs for our fans, does that mean that I should continue to write the songs that I used to write? Or will that mean that they will inevitably say, this is the line in the sand, I'm done at this point? Yeah. What if I tried to grow with them? And that would allow me to write songs that I'm wanting to write that feel like I'm maturing as a songwriter and as a person. And maybe then I would be able to cross that line and they'll be able to take me with them. It's funny is it's almost a reverse though. Like it's really magnanimous that you would consider to be growing with your audience. And I love the way that you put that. But in making those decisions to not stand still, in order to push the boundaries, whether that's your intention or that's what's motivating you, it's having the opposite effect where we feel like we're growing with you and you're pushing yeah. us. And that's what Radiohead have always done. And great artists like that have always been like, there may be moments that you don't get immediately, but you'll come back to them because they make up an essential step in our body of work and they're going to yeah. inform the thing you do like, which is coming next. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I want to lead. I want to say, hey, here's what's next. You may not have known that this is what you're going to love. And that's exciting. But at the same time, I've been burnt in the past as a fan of other other artists and other songwriters where they make too hard of a turn and you can almost smell that they don't like who you fell in love with yeah. and so then they kind of sever that trust there's definitely turns you can take but there's certain degrees of turns that work and others that just come off as you trying to rebel against your own fans did Jumpsuit feel like a hard turn until you released it and realized actually it was a softer curve than you'd initially thought? Because we know that you're heavy because the live performance, you know, has suggested that from day one. But Jumpsuit was just such a beautiful contrast to what was going on at that time. It was an out and out, almost 90s, early 2000s, at least the way it initially kicked in, mm -hmm. sort of in the alt rock kind of like number one anthem. But it wasn't what anyone else was doing at that moment in time. That was the first time that we really focused on trying to capture the energy that we thought we were already doing in the live show. Yeah. Even with the song, when you heard the songs previous to Jumpsuit on an album or on the record, you know, you'd hear a vacuumed in the box version of that song. And for us, yeah. we never heard that song. We heard the version that we were playing live every night. And so with Jumpsuit, we really tasked ourselves to try to anticipate the energy that we wanted to create with the track live. How can we try to capture that? played some Citizen Cope, who I don't really know much about, but feels like a kindred spirit, at least in terms of the desire to fuse this kind of like rhythmic approach to performing with subject matter that's still emotional and still matters, right? I don't know a ton about him either. I've met him once and it was in passing and I don't actually know if we even officially met, but... His vocal delivery is something that I really appreciate. When I met him, I knew, oh, this isn't just his shtick. This is who he is. You know when you hear someone's vocal delivery on a record and then you meet him and there's that disconnect, you wonder, does your voice really go into that different yeah. world when you sing or are you are you reaching for something? And so yeah. it was nice to meet the person, hear the voice and connect it with the records that you're used to and know, okay, this is who he is.
We talked a little bit about Radiohead before and the fact that they like to lead. And, you know, I've always considered 21 Pilots to be part of the DNA of their band, that they've had some kind of significant impact upon you. You've chosen actually the Easy Star, All Stars, Karma Police, which is actually from a brilliant project of Radiohead covered. And there's been a lot of Radiohead covered albums, but they seem to work really well in dub and dance hall. <laughs> they just do. But I just sort of wonder, like, before we get into the specifics, like, was I always on the right path? Did Radiohead, were they an essential influence to you? I think that what Radiohead for me was, one, what they do live is something that I've studied for a while and their approach is both engaging yet not necessarily dependent upon whether or not you want to be engaged. When I hear a song I try to break it down, I try to understand what's going on musically production wise. They've definitely posed plenty of challenges for me. When I hear one of their songs and I'm trying to figure out the timing and where the one is and where the downbeat is you know, what the chord progression even is supposed to be and Sometimes I get frustrated listening to Radiohead. They're the only band that's ever done that to me, and I really appreciate them for that. I spoke to Tom York, gosh, last year, I think. I talked about the way his music can take me to places emotionally and I will use it as a tool to go there. I will actively seek it out if I need to mine. I will use Tom to try to get me there sometimes because it's the musical tool in the box that will help me get there. And I asked him if he feels the same way. When I cry listening to Dawn Chorus, does he cry listening to Dawn Chorus? And he was like, bingo. And I wondered how you relate to that side of yourself as an artist, making music that is ultimately very sad for you at times, very self-aware and it's therapy for you. And whether or not you really love that and you go there willingly or drags you there. I mean, when I'm writing the song, I'm getting the highest dose of that emotion that anyone could feel. And not that when I play the song live or if I hear an old song again that I can't remember what it was like to go through that. But when you're writing that song, you are getting the purest dose of that emotion. And for not just a day, not just for three minutes and 30 seconds, but for maybe two weeks to six months in that song. You're crossing over into a new world where that song now exists. I guess for me, I can't say that I go back to that same place, although I understand it and I remember it. I think that if I did go back to that same place, then it would kind of be eliminating one of the most important things about songwriting for me, which is using it to move forward and using it to get over this thing that I'm working through. And so I'm glad that when I hear songs that I've previously released that I'm not experiencing the purest form of that emotion anymore. It's a different world. Somebody who I feel is unafraid and has given us so many moments to think and reflect is Ben Gibbard, one of my favorite songwriters ever to come from the United States or in fact any country Death Cab for Cutie what an amazing career tell us a Death Cab story Oh, man. I mean, I've been a fan of Death Cab for a long time. I feel like every time people ask me about my favorite bands or artists or whatever, they're always one of the first to come up. There's certain things that you experience with a band that you just never forget and they never leave. Like, I was learning how to drive with them, you know? Like, I was figuring out how to make a left turn with them. I was going on my first road trip with them. First time away from home with them. The Pumpkins are like that for me. Billy Corgan's like that for me. Really? You know? Yeah. No, when you heap all those experiences into one voice and one band, and in one outfit, you just realize like, man, they're always going to be special to me. That's who Death Cab was for me for a long time. And then fast forward a few years and all of a sudden we're playing in Amsterdam on the same day. Actually, we have an off day in Amsterdam. They have a show. We connect with them. We get to go to their show. We meet them. We talk to them before and after the show. It was just one of the coolest group of guys and amazing to be able to experience that. And I'm not one to flaunt those types of experiences, but man, something that I'll just never forget. Now you have to be a fan. You have to be. And that's been one of the best things about this season of shows we've been doing from Isolation is that we've really reconnected with the artist as a fan. You know, yeah. last time we spoke, it was like, Tyler, let's talk about Tyler. And it's so nice being able to dive into those experiences and realize that those matter to you. Death Care for Cutie, different names for the same thing. Wow, no one breaks a heart like being given, man, seriously. At 
home with Tyler Joseph from 21 Pilots. Electric President, Insomnia, I'm out. Dragon's Den, I'm done. Shark Tank, I'm out. I don't know this at all. You have to fill really? me in. I do not know this song. You got the floor, Tyler. I, I don't know a whole ton about this guy, but he's just a DIY. He's one of the first bedroom artists that I'd ever heard. You know, this was one of the first guys for me that I started listening to that I knew the backstory was this is just a guy trying to figure it out. You know, he's got no backing. He's got no label. He's got no budget. He just grabs some instruments. He figured out the first time how to record on a computer. And it just, in high school, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, hearing what this guy was doing, and you could tell inside of the production that, you know, it wasn't top notch as far as big budget studio. You could almost start to see the details of the room that he's in when he was writing and producing the record. And so for me, I fell in love with this guy's style just because it felt attainable for me. There's a light bulb dangling from string It's slowly swaying up over my head now As I jot down the words that'll never be sung You started out as a band that I felt did have that DIY ethos. And is it important to you that you maintain that to some degree? Yeah, you know, there was a phrase used one time, ooh, that's a major label kick drum. It's like, (laughs) you can pay for things to start sounding better. Should I try to be swapping all of my sounds that I'm getting by myself to get into the highest level of, I don't know, sound spectrum? Should I? And I think that for me, I've always felt a little behind, like I was trying to catch up with songwriters and producers and programmers. And a part of this is just Josh being a great friend and an awesome collaborator and confidant where he's the one saying, hey, I don't think we need to go try to replace these drums. I don't think we need to recut these vocals. We don't need to come up with like a better version of the instrumentation. And slowly I'm starting to realize that the final version of these songs can be right here in front of me on this laptop. Not everything needs to sound like extreme, Tyler. Not everyone Mm -hmm. can have the major label guitar sound. Not everybody (laughs) can make more than words ring out the way they made this one ring out. (laughs) You know what? Sometimes it's just more than words. So let's just shush, come back and talk about this. More than words, man. Wow. What What an anthem, though. Unbelievable. It was actually the first time that I started to understand harmony, you know, because that harmony is so out front in the mix. And you're trying to figure out, like, wait, hold on. There's that one note where they go, Oh, then you do see, and you... And yet it works. It was number one for like 90 weeks in New Zealand when it came out. It was like, oh my God, bro. Like I said, it was the first time where Harmony was really like, okay, what are they doing? How are they playing off each other? And when you hear the song, it's like you can memorize the Harmony or you can try to see why that Harmony works with that chord. Mm. That's what this song was for me. It was like, I want to see why that Harmony is an option. Anybody who's ever seen that band perform that song live will tell you that the crowd all sings the Harmony. So there's your answer. (laughs) It's like the Harmony is the lead and the lead is the harmony. It's just like, more than words is all you have to do. That do. Do. Yeah, that's not the melody. Whoa, that's so odd. It's such an odd thing. Appreciate that throwback. Holy moly. We're going straight into uh, a song called Go Tell Her. Why is this on the playlist? People ask me, you know, who are your artists that inspire you? And this song by this guy, Genova Addison, is like, this is an example of why it's hard for me to just pick an artist and be like, hey, everything this artist has ever created is an inspiration for me. There are certain moments with certain songs. I grew up in the age of, hey, give me your iPod. Let me rip everything off that iPod and put it onto my iPod. And I don't know where you got this single song. I'm going to have it as well. And the, Mm -hmm. the album art is all blurry. I don't know a lot of his other work, but I just know that this is a song that I keep coming back to. Was it exciting growing up in the kind of Napster iPod generation? You know, that moment when music became instantly accessible? Because to me, being a bit older and already being in the industry at that point, I was torn between what was Mm. clearly an exciting development 
and a much needed pull back into the hands of the fan. Was it exciting being just a fan at that time? Yeah, I guess I didn't realize exactly because I was so young at the time that I was stealing. <laughs> well, no, you're actually, you're creating the building blocks for the new model, which is that music is ultimately infinitely shareable. You know what though? I was also, because when it first hit, there were certain friends who knew how to do it. I was paying my friend Brady three bucks a CD. So wow. as far as I'm concerned, I was paying for it. <laughs> Brady? Brady's hustle was deep. He just knew he just knew how to do it. And he would put this stupid, silly song at the end of every CD he would rip for people. And you would know. It was his tag. Just write the songs down that you want. I'll get you a CD by next week. You know, three bucks. How scalable was this business model, do you think? Estimate. What do you reckon Brady's like long-term haul was over the course of the two or three years he was probably active? You reckon he pulled in a few grand? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Take my advice. Kiss the eyes before you throw the dice. It just kind of presses buttons in me, you know. If I hear John C at a certain time of the day, I could be having a perfectly good day, and the next thing you know, I need a minute. Just need a minute, you know. Yeah, I mean, this song in particular, Grow Till Tall, came off of his like personal solo release, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I knew that he was trying to use more English because he doesn't usually write in English. And yet somehow, with English not being his first language, he still picked the right words, even though they were, you know, missing some words in between. What's so great about his recording and writing process is it's so hard to create a build in the box. And what I mean by that is, like, when you have your programmed keyboards in the box, it's all pre-recorded stuff that you're triggering, right? One of the hardest things to do is to create this natural, continuing build of energy and sound with stuff that's just in the box. Yeah. And so you got a guy like Yonzi who he knows how to tap into these players that are on violin in these real string sections in these just awesome ways of creating soundscapes through running his electric guitar through different outboard gear. They can take you to a place where it's so much more impactful and so much more meaningful and so much more triumphant and yet it doesn't feel like it got any louder. Yeah. It's so crazy. There's definitely a, a science to it and I think it has a lot to do with having the ability to record real instruments. You can tell a player on a real instrument to start building and to start adding velocity to those strikes and there's something human about it that you just can't recreate in the box you when can't. you're producing a record. They're few and far between of artists who can use the box as you put it and also the digital box to create emotion mm. and, and to and to really make it feel like, oh my God, I'm dying. You know, I'm just, ah, uh, it's just killing me. The song is so emotional, you know? Yeah, it's yeah I mean, you have to have skill in production mm. to accomplish that. Whereas guys like Yonzi that can hear the song before it happens and he can explain it to his players yeah. and then he can rally them around to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Tyler Joseph from 21 Pilots. We are just over halfway through your playlist. I love it, man. Full scale music nerdery. You know, you've got a nice little perch outside. I'm in a, a room in my house, which doubles as uh, our kids' gaming room. So I had to kick them out to do these things. And they're always like, who is it? And I'm like, 21 Pilots. And I'm like, all right. And then they leave. You know, <laughs> If it's legit, they leave, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like I have to drag them out by the feet. We're going to get uh, back into music right now. I want to talk about Matt Kearney. Who's Matt Kearney? Matt Kearney is a singer-songwriter from Nashville. I kind of came across him because he was an opening slot for a John Mayer tour, which I didn't even right. go to. A friend of mine went to it. They loved his opening slot so much. They got his record. He just struck me as someone fearless that was excited about chords. He loved melody, but also would go into this spoken word thing. Mm -hmm. And he came into my life in a moment where I knew I loved to rap and I loved to write poetry and I loved to deliver some of these verses in that manner, but I didn't know... I didn't have anyone telling me that that was okay. And I guess he said that to me through his record. I didn't meet him until much later. But yeah, this is a song that was important for me. I meant it all in every part In every word right from the start I'll never let this love fall in the middle What was the plan, Tyler? What was the plan, if you don't mind saying or giving us an insight as to what 2020 was looking like before everything changed shape? I mean, we had a lot of festivals on the books. You know, we were going to go around the world. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was a victory lap or whatever, but it was definitely a time to go reap what it is we had sown on that record 
trench and just like a lot of artists it was completely ripped away but you know i was talking to my manager about it we got lucky we had our release you know we released trench in 2018 we toured all of 19 we did our arena runs all over the world and 20 for us was a bunch of festivals in europe festivals in south america and a few here stateside you know we had a headline in moscow that we were really excited about we were going to do our first stadium in moscow so yeah a lot of plans put on hold and we're hoping that we'll be able to just kind of like pick up a lot of those plans and move them over to another year but We're still making decisions and trying to figure out what's the right move. We were talking before we kicked into this conversation official. We were just having a bit of a personal catch up and I hope I'm not gassing you too hard, but it was an interesting observation. You were saying, you know, like there's going to be a lot more creativity and in the absence of touring and, you know, what do creative people do with their time? Well, they create, right? And you just continue to create. And then it's up to you whether you release it or not release it. But it begs the question, you know, whether or not perhaps what was going to be a year of travel and a year of experience and a year of, as you say, putting the trench era, putting a ribbon on it, with that now being on hold, it gives you that space in that time are you feeling creative we have this song does it allude to anything or was it just because your mum felt like she needed that thing and it inspired you two part question and can mum come up with some more things that she needs so that she can inspire you to keep making records <laughs> she needs another house <laughs> <laughs> you better write some fucking records then <laughs> <laughs> it's with no bridges we're going no from bridge. chorus to chorus baby seriously one big chorus <laughs> it's gonna be two minutes long no, I, I'm writing a record right now, and I'm not sure when it'll be released, but it, it's definitely going to be released sooner than we were planning on releasing a record. You know, I don't know if it's this, like, in-between record or if it's a continuation of the narrative and where we left off. It's kind of mm. hard for me to tap into the story of Trench and what we've been building on up until that point without being out there, without touring, without having those live shows, without interacting with our fans. And, um, man, as much as I appreciate everyone getting on their computer and playing acoustic bedroom versions of stuff, it's just it's old to me I don't want to just do that I want to talk to our fans through a record you know and, and so that's that's what I'm currently working on right before I got on the call I was working on a new idea so right. I'm excited about it a bunch of great records who played matters yahoo who i haven't played in a very very long time who um came out of, of nowhere and made bold and really serious and brilliant creative artistic statements and really kind of ruffled some feathers as well just by the very nature of the art that he was making but has yeah. ultimately gone on to have an incredible career really great career i just appreciate fearlessness and at a time where we could use some of that i look back at artists that struck me as fearless in their songwriting and their presentation and their uh, just their style and mm-hmm. he's someone who strikes me as fearless especially when he first came on the scene we played Mike Snow as well, and I feel like that's another band that you could easily tour the world with. Just in the way that they approach their songwriting, the way they fuse technology into the group dynamic. It's a unique structure, just like 21 Pilots is. It's like yeah. three producers, a major songwriter, and two other songwriters, all kind of swapping instruments and just doing sh- Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about them. I do know that they get great mixes. So it's whatever oh, they're dude. doing to their percussion, the, the spectrum of sound with, with how their, their kick is hitting. And yeah, uh, I listen to them a lot to try to reference what a good mix is. I know you're a private guy and I respect that. We've always had good conversations off the record and but now we're on the record, but we're also kind of off the record. Everyone's kind of at home and it's just a weird time. And so my question to you at this point is kind of how does the day-to-day feel? How does being in this situation on a personal level feel right now? I know you're making a record, which is great. It's the best distraction fans could hope for. How does the sort of restlessness of your soul and your spirit as a creative wrestle the unavoidable stillness of what is happening right now? I think naturally I don't mind being home, but I, I do worry about bigger things, you know, What's going to change forever? What aren't we going to get back? Whether it's just daily personal interactions or live music as a whole. You know, my grandfather who passed away a few years ago, one of his most amazing strengths was his ability to just strike up a conversation with a stranger. 
and for him to just break them out of their, you know, every stranger that walks by who's just got this cold wall in front of them, he could penetrate through that and just get them to laugh or to chuckle or to say hi or whatever. And man, I learned a lot from him because that was such an option for him was to just strike up a conversation with anyone. So you're asking me how I'm doing. I look at that and I go, I hope we don't lose that. You know, I hope we don't lose the ability to just interact with strangers and to, to somehow form these connections with people we barely know. Because right now I know that the few times that I go out, you better believe I'm not making eye contact. I'm, you know, I'm staying away from people mm. and man, it feels weird. I hope we don't lose what makes us human. like you're someone who has tucked himself away into this private universe where you're able to create live your life with your friends with your family by choice and then when that choice is taken away from you you i found as someone who is naturally reclusive at times too which might come as a surprise to listeners i you know i like being away Mm -hmm. and yet that was my choice now it's not my choice anymore i'm starting to wonder whether or not maybe i took it too far a little bit sometimes and i should have been a little bit more open to the elements you know Yeah, no, I mean, I even think about that when I go on the road and I tour. I've been to so many cities and lucky enough that music has taken me all around the world. But when people ask me about my favorite places I've been, this default, I don't know, maybe almost to a fault, taking pride in staying in the arena or staying at the venue and not going out and not seeing these cities. Yeah. You know, now is a time when I look back at that and I wonder, man, should I have pushed myself, made myself a little more uncomfortable, gone out, experienced these things in these places? And I think that this time being forced to stay home has made me reevaluate that philosophy to where when I do get back out there, I want to make sure that I'm soaking it in. Nothing makes you think like the postal service. Oh man, you are so on fire right now, dude. Your playlist is just like, (laughs) I can tell you're a bit of a playlist nerd and you buried it deep in here, but I can tell you took care in putting this together because there's a lot of really big moments at the end and that's always a telltale sign. Let's talk about postal service. Man, another project where it felt like the simplicity and the dry production and even the backstory of them passing production ideas back and forth and building the tracks remotely. It, it felt was so unique at the time. It was just like, what oh, are yeah. they doing? You, you never heard anything like it before. But also when you heard that for me as someone who wanted to be an aspiring songwriter and producer, it felt like, oh, here's something I can emulate and I can attain this. And these bedroom style loops and noises and little field recordings of stupid sounds the refrigerator makes when it shuts and all this like those are all options and no one had ever told me that before i think it also kind of in a weird way dare i be dramatic was sort of a microscopic step into a space we're in now where everybody's trading ideas back and forth remotely and that's how we have to live at the minute yeah we owe postal service a lot Will someone please call a surgeon who can crack my ribs and repair this broken heart say goodbye at home with Tyler Joseph from 21 Pilots on Apple Music. The red jumpsuit apparatus. We played your guardian angel and I'd love to know why. This was actually the first song that I performed in front of people. I covered it with some friends at my high school at one of our assemblies, or I think it was like a talent show or something, and I'd never played the piano, I'd never sang, and man, what a song to try to sing in front of people for the first time. His range is ridiculous, but... I'll never forget just driving to school the day of the performance and just singing my heart out in my car, getting there, trying to practice and warm up. And by the time the performance came around and I got up there, I realized that I'd almost fried my voice just practicing. And so that was the beginning of my long, tough relationship with managing my voice. Why did you do it? If as somebody who perhaps needed the courage to be able to find your voice and perform in front of people, a lot of people don't ever take that shot. Yeah. I've always really appreciated how thoughtful you are and I feel like there's an introverted side to you. So what pushed you onto the stage that day? There was something that happened in middle school for me. I think I was in seventh grade, probably just 12 or 13. I mean, I was the jock. You know, I didn't do music. I stayed in my lane as I didn't touch it. But a buddy of mine knew that I really liked music. I was starting to learn how to play the piano. And he asked me, hey, me and a couple of guys are going to sing a song for the school. And I know it's one you know. 
and it was a switch foot song and you know why don't you come up and sing it with us and i was like no 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 no, no. i don't do that i don't get up on yeah. in front i've never done that before and, and so then being in the audience of this thing that i was invited to do and watching them you know my friends sing this song on acoustic guitar and everyone enjoying it and loving it i remember thinking i will never turn down an opportunity to do that again like i can't believe that i was too afraid to do that i have to prove to myself that I can conquer that fear. So from that point on, anytime, whether it was in school or whatever, that an opportunity was to get up in front of people, I always tried to force myself to do it, even though I think my mm. default was to not. Regina Spector, oh man, just another remarkable singer, songwriter, performer, just honest, righteous. Yeah, this track specifically showed me that the biggest moment of the song could be that all of the instrumentation drops out except for the drums in the vocal and you just open that hi-hat a little bit. That hi-hat's been closed and dry the entire song and then you just open it a little bit, drop everything else out and you have the biggest moment of your song. And turns like that in production with a song like this taught me a lot. I never loved nobody fully Always one foot on the ground And it breaks my heart When it breaks my heart you know, watching you perform live and watching the way that you bring magic into the equation and you bring a sense of disbelief, you suspend belief at moments in your set and you've always liked to subvert that way. And, and I wonder from your perspective, what's magic for you? Like what really takes you to the place that you take us when you're mm -hmm. creating those illusions? A lot of time gets put into the show, whether it's the set list, the lighting design, you know, the flow of the show, even the logistics of this mic stand needs to be here at this point. And because this mic stand is downstage, we should go into another song that has a downstage mic. And if we need to transition to another song that doesn't have the downstage mic stand there, then I need to build an intro so that there's time. Mm -hmm. I wanted to eliminate any of those kind of awkward, meaningless moments of the show. When I'm creating that and I'm down in my studio working on the show, putting myself there and trying to feel, is this going to be pulled off correctly? Does this song feel right? That's when I'm fully living in that moment that eventually we take people on that journey when we actually go play. So I'm doing it months, years before the tour itself. Yeah. And that's when I'm really getting sent to that place as I'm trying to put myself in that seat, in that pit. How do you enjoy it then? If you're creating a show which we get to enjoy, the traders, you've created this amazing, flawless experience, doing away with all the unnecessary elements of a live performance in order to create something compelling front to end. Mm. But sometimes those meaningless elements are what the artist gets out of it, where they just thrash around and you're not quite sure what's going to happen. And I wonder how you get lost in it when it's been so choreographed. The truth is I don't always enjoy it. And I think that the exaggerated physical movements is you watching me trying to and being pushed to find the good to find that nugget that is worth your time is where you start to really see a good performance to live a good performance and yeah some of the stuff it's scripted we have to know what the next song is we've got to be on the same page but trying to create tent poles where this is for sure going to happen and this is for sure going to happen but inside of there let's be spontaneous let's interact with the audience mm. you can't script that you can't rehearse what it's like putting a drum kit on top of a crowd it's either they're going to hold you or they're not and so what was that like the first time you saw that i couldn't believe it worked i, I was like <laughs> you know i have this idea putting a drum because we kept on testing stuff you know obviously like we would stand on the crowd then we would put one drum on the crowd then we would stand on the drum that's on the crowd and i was like man let's just go for it let's put a full kit out there and they're strong they got it he hasn't Drinking fallen numbers. yet i was gonna say not even once he hasn't even turned at the end of a show and gone and got dicey at that point not even close yeah i mean there are definitely moments where it's like that didn't go as well like someone's grabbing stuff or pulling the mic away or i mean we've done it hundreds of times now we're bound to come you know come across something yeah. but it's amazing that it's succeeded each time roy orbison you got it i love that you went into what i would consider to be a copyright a real copyright here a real moment that gets passed around from generation to generation to play the family reunions christmas birthdays bar mitzvahs whatever it is people will get the guitar out of a certain age and they'll play it and everyone will know it why are we listening to it right now on tyler joseph's play that's right here on because he has timpani in there <laughs> it's just like why would you do that that doesn't make sense and it works so well every time i look into your loving eyes 
me, I try to eliminate the baggage that comes with songs. You know, whether it's extremely famous or it's, you know, overdone or it's almost like not cool enough because it's so well known. But this song for me, I heard it in a restaurant and I remember thinking, man, I've never actually listened to this song. I've always just kind of let it go. And then so I bought the track and I really started to dive in and listen to it. And it's such a good song. I mean, there's a reason why it reaches that level of recognition. And sometimes people lose sight of that. They just think that it's so big and famous and old and classic because it is classic. But there's a reason why it got there. And to really listen to the structure and the melody inside those chords and and some of the production moves, I had a really good time diving into this song. When you sit at home right now and you think about not just the performing of live or what it is to make another record, as you said, you're thinking about ideas and what 21 Pilots turns into. But when you think about the pace you were going and the speed at which you were going, and we were all going, does it come as a surprise that we've all stopped to some degree to you? Or do you think it makes sense that we have to stop and take stock? I know I've found some good in it. I've worked on me. When you're forced to stop, that's one of the first things, or at least eventually it comes around on your to-do list, is to work on you. I think that in that sense, it's been good. And I'm glad that we've been given the time to do that. And I hope that people do that. Because once this is over and we get back together, I think that we could all do some really cool things. I think we've learned a lot about what we need and what we don't need, what we take for granted and what we miss. The things that we're supposed to appreciate will be more obvious to us. Be like, ah, this moment coming by me right now, I need to be here. All right, The Strokes, Under Cover of Darkness. You know, The Strokes keep showing up on these playlists, which is so rewarding for me being a Strokes fan and not knowing what they mean to Billie Eilish, but she loves them, not knowing what they mean to you, but you love them. Artists that are younger that have somehow continued to carry The Strokes, and Billy picked three songs off the new record, and you picked a song off the previous one, off Angles. So I'm interested to, like, what is The Strokes to you? Give us your overarching feeling about The Strokes before we bid you adieu. It feels like he's in the room with them as they're playing their instruments. It feels like he's there. It feels like the singer and the players, they're there. There's certain songs where you can really pick up, like, they weren't with each other. They weren't on the same page. Maybe it's not physically in the same place, but at least they weren't creating the idea together. They just kind of created this mutant idea where one had one idea, someone had another idea. Whether it's these co-writers or you can even tell in some bands, okay, these were two ideas mushed together. So the strokes for me, both in the way that they're recorded and the songs that they write, it just feels like one force coming at you, which is really, I think, kind of rare today. Tyler, it's been so good to see you. Congratulations on getting new music out in this time frame because I think it's an important step. And good luck with the process of making new music. Enjoy the time with family, stay healthy, and always appreciate the time we get to spend together. So thanks, man. Thanks for the call, man. Appreciate it. Take care, man. Peace. Panic on the brain.